So welcome to Chaos Podcast with Scott Barnett, multi-Emmy award-winning filmmaker, documentarian, uh, producer, director, drone pilot. We're getting to that, right? <laughs> Stay tuned. Here comes Scott. Welcome to another episode. We've made it this far. We've made it to the point where I finally showed some credibility that other people are willing to come onto the podcast and and share their knowledge. So I want to say thank you to all that are watching. I think we've we finally hit the six digits of views, which is a hundred thousand or something. And I know we're going to get a lot of more soon, uh, which is pretty incredible considering you know this started as just hey let's start talking about things. And with that said, I have a dear friend. And someone who is incredibly knowledgeable about uh, cigars, coffee, and also filmmaking, especially filmmaking, and, and, and in, being behind in the camera. In that order, in that order. Yeah. So we're going to, when that being said, normally, normally, we always have cocktails and coffee, uh, right. co cocktails, but today we're doing coffee. When I tell you Scott knows everything about <laughs> Miami and, or South Florida, or Florida, um, he showed up with this, and for those that know, I have a espresso machine, and we grind our own beans and do all that. But he said, "I have coffee for you. You must go there." And um, so I'm. We're we're doing coffee today. It's going to be a different type of podcast, but we are having our cigars. So with that said, I want to in introduce Mr. Scott Barnett. Now we do the applause. Yay! There it is. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and there goes the dog. He's very excited. Well, no, but seriously, Scott, thank you, because I know how busy, and I know you're always doing stuff, and you're running around, and I do appreciate it, because uh, it's tough to always run up and get your Emmys and be doing, uh, you know, you're very busy collecting Emmys. Yes. <laughs> so with that said, um, why don't we start with the most important thing, the coffee? So tell me where the 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 story behind this place you were telling me earlier no i just years ago uh found a place uh called macondo uh macondo coffee roasters <clears throat> here in miami uh colombian coffee but they do all you know various That's ways of prepping really it really good yeah it's very good it's and, very and this good. is the uh the chemex mix they do where you know they put the traditional filter on mm -hmm. and they pour hot water over the beans so it slowly percolates down and is just like uh, the best way to have your coffee. And, it, and it's not too far from the chaos made studios. So. I know, so now I know of a spot, maybe we'll go there for lunch afterward. And this is actually, seriously, you can taste the flavor. It's, it's very good coffee. What, what people don't understand about, or they do, but one of the advantages we have in Miami because it's such a multicultural city is you get places like this. You get people from all over the world, you get great restaurants, great places, you know, just, you know, any kind of thing that you're looking for, you can find it in Miami. The so, so the and cigars. that's true with cigars as cigars well. As We're close well. enough to Cuba. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, is there some Cubans here in Miami? So, yeah, actually, um, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, one of my great grandfathers actually was in New York and moved down to Key West in the late 1800s, believe it, like the 18, 1890s. To work in the cigar industry down in Key West. No you way. That yeah. That's yeah. That's there so, were. How many people were in Key West in the 1800s? I know it, Flagler built the right the railroad. In the 19th century, there was a time period when Key West was the biggest city in Florida. Yeah, absolutely. Well, was, there you go. You're it was the biggest city in Florida, and Key and the West. and the Cubans that were in Key West and Tampa, those were the turn of the century, the Spanish American War Cubans that people. Sometimes forget we're here before a lot of other people. Right. So, but, I mean, that's all another story. Actually, Florida and Cuba have always had very strong relations from the very beginning. And uh, ever since Florida was, you know, part of the Spanish Empire. So now we're going to get into the history. I was going to say, yeah. and now it, see, we, we, you <clears throat> lied. There was more than that that you covered. We're now in history before we even yes. got to that. So yes. that was number four. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, I mean, just in... in Recent decades with the Cuban exile community coming here. Actually, Tampa was more known as, you know, kind of the cigar capital of the states. Um, but I always said, like, back in the 90s or so, 
Miami started gaining more prominence just because of all the families that you had here. Miami and, Vice. And, and Miami Vice. <laughs> and Well, but you had families like the, 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 the Padrones, which, you know, mm -hmm. Padron Cigars and, you know, all the various manufacturers. I, my, my, actually, this is an Aurora, which actually it's interesting about Aurora because it used to be that we're getting into cigar talk here, but yeah. Aurora originally was like the cigar you would find at the local, you know, Cuban cafeterias when you're drinking Cuban coffee. And um, it, it was, I think, a popular like everyday brand. But, you know, over the years, as cigars became more popular, Aurora became one of the brands that they, you know, started really going hardcore into good tobacco. And, and uh, but, you know, I don't have it here, but one of my favorites is La Gloria Cubana. Oh, I know that one. Yeah. yeah. And the El Credito factory used to be right on A Street. Anyways, we're getting in. We're getting no, into, I love this. We're getting I, into all the cigar talk. And I love it. Now I, have to, to now I have production. to light it. And, okay, so then I have a question for you. As a cigar person, I always pull off my label. Yeah. I don't know. It's. A, are you a... I do. I do. Uh, I mean, I yeah, I, I, I generally do pull off the label. I mean, some people like to smoke it. Most people that smoke it with the label are because they're trying to show it off. Ah. especially if they have a cuban like a real cuban cigar which you know i may get a lot of haters when i say this but cuban cigars aren't the same as what they used to be oh well 100 percent um i'm in bahamas all the time and or get to get over there and obviously there's many different variations and the only place that i really enjoy is uh great uh great, great yeah you'd be, i was yeah you sorry so i couldn't even get the words out yeah. you knew you yeah. got that excited and i have some of the gray cliff stuff and i love their yeah. cigar it's probably my favorite no but, no uh, they have great cigars but uh but i started smoking cigars very limited oops sorry give that a click what there you go um did i did i give it a shot there we, there we go. go i um i started cigars back in new york when i was actually in the financial business or working at a financial did company. you ever go to nat sherman Oh my God! Did I go to Nat? Oh, so that's a memory. Nat Sherman was that's one of my favorites. Memory. Yeah, they always had great cigars. They did. And then when I finally went to their shop in New York, that was like, a, yeah, you know, heaven a, for a you. Privilege, sure. absolutely. Well, you know, Davidoff actually had their own store back in the in the nineties, and it would they had back in the nineties. Davidoff made some nice, very mild, but just a easy smoking cigar. I'm not as rich as you. Well, you know, Davidoff is that for, was for the rich people. That was that was a long time ago. Right now, I'm just glad. Hey. You brought the cigars. <laughs> so there you go. So I wouldn't say, uh, you know. Um, mm. Well, my friend, this is the perfect way to kick off a podcast. Absolutely. There's a, there's a theme going on now. Yeah. I'm getting all my buddies, you know, and, uh, and we're like, okay, let's have a cigar. Just and missing cigar the and coffee. Now. You know what this, well, I, I'm, I might not be missing the rum, but <laughs> I, uh, it's funny because J Dennis Leary, Back sure. in the day, yeah. when a comedian, and he used to joke, he's got a skit about coffee-flavored coffee, and he's like, I swore coffee was invented by people who just wanted to stay up and smoke more cigar and call it cigarettes. Yeah, and I like and that. it's a really funny thing from the 80s, so I always laugh about coffee because I'm like, nope, just black coffee, and, and, and uh, you know, thank God I never did the cigarette thing because that stuff. can be. Yeah. But the cigars every once in a while, so this is my uh, closing out the year celebration cigar, and I got you here. Anyway. I'm sorry, I'm digressing, taking you all throughout the history of Miami and all this sort of stuff, but I'm, I, I, I didn't know if we knew back then, I would have had cigars on set all the time. All the time. And I should, I, I sh how do I, I'll open this even a little more by saying how we met was a very funny story to me because both of us being in production but, um, and, um, and, and you, um, so let me back up. So I'm sitting there, and uh, I think I have a magazine, and I'm trying to be quiet. I'm trying to be, for those that know, a datager, right? I'm sitting in the back being a datager and just sitting there flipping through my thing, and all of a sudden I hear out of the corner, you know, over there while my son is at a, a table read or do it. Well, it was a table read or something. You guys were – it was kick, kind of kicking <clears throat> off the, the the TV show. Oh, probably, yeah. And, yeah, and then I hear – yeah, my dad flies drone, or do if we had somebody who did drones, and then the next thing I know, like, yeah, the world got very small very fast. Absolutely. So it's funny how you can meet people in this industry, and years later, you have to do their podcast. <laughs> well, you and I, actually, I always had fun with you, because you and I were very similar. We're always kind of like, 
<clears throat> playing around with the same equipment. You know, I think besides the drones, both you and I did our period of time with 360 cameras. Oh my God, the VR and the know? three. Oh. And so that was, you know, and then and then yeah, just going through the various, you know, camera equipment. What so, do you ever think is going to go on with VR? You, you think? I th well, I think it's doing well with Meta. I mean, with games, I think a lot of people are doing the, you know, doing well with that with games. And, but from a and, filmmaker standpoint, <clears throat> I think uh, it comes down to everything. Is is if there's a story, yeah. then it'll engage people. And you know, we've seen with social media, for instance, that. You know, unless there's, I mean, social media is two things. It's either a good story or just some kind of sideshow going on right. that, that gets people's attention. Um, but 360 was always interesting for me because, you know, I would, you know, put cameras on race cars. I, I put it on, you know, one time I was with the uh, the Golden Knights, the, mm -hmm. the Army paratroopers, and went out of a plane with the cameras on and, did some really fun, crazy things with 360, but what's interesting is whenever I showed the 360 people, either you give them like, you know, the goggles or on the phone or whatever, they look at it and they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then they hand it back to you. They look at it for five seconds. Yeah. So there's nothing there to engage them. So, you know, this, you know, our world of media, no matter what, side of it you're on you know it always comes back to there has to be a good story um to engage people and you know it's it's the reason that people you know binge watch shows and streaming shows or movies or what have you or just tiktok or whatever it is but it's just got to be something or else you know they they slide to the They're, next yeah. thing so um, in the world of content we're living in there's yeah, so yeah. much more than there used to be yeah it's, yeah yeah i don't know i, I you know i still I go back and forth, and I think that uh, 360, I, I still find it interesting, but I don't find it, you know, like you just said, the problem for me with 360 now is that exactly what you said, either either watch it for a minute or you'll put it on, and it, yes, it's super immersive, but it's not a community, you know, you can go and sit in a movie theater together and walk out and share that experience, or, you know, they're just there's something that... I don't see it as I don't first off ever see it as a long form content format. It's a very much immersive snippet type of thing, and I think the limitation is like, you know, the headset where it just you know the 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 gear and all that I'll stuff. I'll tell you right the now. the one place that I think it does work really well, um, and there's a lot of potential is underwater. Yeah, because it's the one place. Because usually 360, you know, you just got the sky above you. Right, and that's it. right. But when you're underwater and you're going through stuff. You want to look around. It gives you that, you know. Was that a lead? Did you know I actually did something like that? Yeah, I know. You, oh, okay. Yeah, I was yeah, like, absolutely. was that a lead-in for absolutely. the? Absolutely, no. <laughs> so if you yeah. go Google, like, no, I think it was no, it was NOAA, University of Miami, and a big charity, and we did the coral reef, mm -hmm. and I wound up getting pulled down and down there and doing some really cool thing, and it turned into a neat little thing. But anyway, I, so I was like, wait, did you? Was that were you? Yeah. You were leading me in on that one. Thank you. I appreciate you on that. But with that said. Um, you know, uh, I have this amazing TV behind us, you know, this built into this wall here as I bump my mic. And um, we spent all this time preparing for you all a video. And by that means I asked God, hey, and he said, I have this video. I said, please. So with that, I'm, I want to I want to talk about you and your background and, and getting involved in this industry and uh, look at this. I know that logo right there. That's right. So tell it. Tell us what, uh, how you kind of got started and what a lot of this is, because I want to talk about it. Because I love this actually, early. Actually, that that cat. This, this cat and this. What that, is this? That cat. I made a. Actually, that was one of my famous uh, things. Um, I got started in the business when I was about fourteen, um, and I got my first VHS camera. Is that you, fourteen? No, that's me as a baby. Okay, I was wondering. But. Um, uh, actually that cat right at the beginning, you know, was, uh, supposed to match the MGM cat. Right. But, uh, <laughs> I did the first short film I did was about a cat that was my outside cat. Cause I'm actually allergic to cats, but I took care of a cat named Louie, Louie, who happened to be a female cat. Oh, and, okay. uh, unfortunately I, well, or fortunately I gave that cat some milk one time. And is, when you give a cat milk, they're yours. Oh, I was going to say they're it's yours. lactose intolerant. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. They become yours. So, and, uh, this is just some fun video I did. Uh, I went to the university of Miami and I recently did a talk there, um, 
about, you know, documentaries. And this was kind of like a little spoof mockumentary I made uh, about about my life. Um, and uh, but, you know, it, it's all in good fun. It's very um, I, it's funny how I think a lot of us get started. And now you look at today's world like back in the day. This this was not easy to put together. No, 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 <laughs> no. When you, no. yeah, <laughs> yeah. If they understand linear editing, Oof. and then you mess up. So I mean, and and maybe I'll explain it now. Today in today's day and age, a lot of kids out there are now you know doing nonlinear editing, whether iMovie, Final Cut, or Premiere, whatever it is. And you know you can move things around. And actually, that's the old film style. With right. old films, you could take sections of film and put them in any order that you want. But with the advent of videotape, it was on reels. Yeah. And the only way to edit is, you know this, but the only way to edit was to edit things in order on, on, on a, you know, a long reel of videotape as you laid it down one after the other. The thing is, is if you mess up and you need to re-edit, you had to go back to the beginning and start over again and relay everything down. They called that linear editing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, you know, that was the way broadcast television was done ever since, I mean, I guess I Love Lucy as soon as, you know. And putting B-roll. How about B-roll over that? And then and putting like, B-roll oh. on, and then you could lay B-roll on top of it and all that fun stuff. But this is going back to my days at the University of Miami. This was a, a film I did about a Cuban rafter. Um, and uh, actually, it's a good friend of mine, Lenny Edelstein, who's an actor in Hollywood now. And... Uh, um, but we had a, a good time doing that. Uh, actually, one of the benefits of going to the University of Miami, give them a plug, was the fact that they let you do your own films and direct your own films, whereas a lot of schools, they kind of like, you can, like, I don't know if it's still the same now, but USC, for instance, undergrads could only work on graduate films as assistants or crew people, that sort of thing. Um, and other schools, you know, kind of take control of the films, that sort of thing. So the University of Miami was really good about letting people, you know, create their own films that became their own films and you could enter, in the, enter them in festivals and, um, you know, so. And, and they probably supported you a lot, right? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes a lot of universities, especially one like Miami, they're more focused on uh, film theory. Mm -hmm. But in terms of getting you out into the world, um, there's something to be said for a lot of the more trade schools that actually are more active in getting people involved in the local production. You know, uh, uh, a place like uh, Valencia or Full Sail. Right. You know, those type of schools, I think, do a better job of working with the local production community and getting people involved. Um, you know, University of Miami was a little bit, uh, I'm, I'll say it, elitist, and they wanted to create the next writers, directors, producers. But, you know, you don't come out of school just you know, becoming a writer, director, producer, you kind of have to get some e experience, under get you. experience. Um, but I will say, um, actually my first experience, uh, you know, real experience with equipment was actually in high school. I was very lucky. We had a three camera studio, which wasn't common back then. It's the right. 1980s. Um, <laughs> and, uh, we had a three camera studio and we were doing shows and, you know, had to learn how to white balance cameras and, and wow, that's, yeah, that's... this was, this was, <laughs> this was during college. I was in Spain and uh actually i was talking about I, this was part of this presentation i always loved the romance of bullfighting and that would later lead to a uh, rodeo documentary i did back in 2021 called state of rodeo because i wanted you know there's something about the romance of bulls that i lo always loved um and i wanted to you know manifest that somehow so actually um my other background besides film is in history so i always enjoy uh, the history of things, uh, different industries, I've noticed that. You different, always, yeah. different backgrounds. So this film was called State of Rodeo, which um, highlighted the history of cattle ranching and rodeos here in the state of Florida. And, and actually, most people don't know, but Florida is the first cowboy state. So just to give the boring history, back in 1521, Ponce de Leon came here to settle the southwest coast of Florida, and he brought the first livestock from Cuba. Um, and eventually that resulted in the, uh, the, you know, the later Spanish missions and St. Augustine forming 1565. And they, they had these ranchos, which were, you know, cattle ranches. 
um, to supply these new, you know, colonies and communities. Um, and so these were the first cattle and horses in North America, before Texas, before the West. So before the West was the West, the East was the best. So. Oh, I love uh. <laughs> <laughs> So, but, uh, th- but this was a lot of fun because this was running around the state of Florida, going to different rodeos and just, you know. I remember kind of, talking to you when you were doing yeah, this and yeah. uh, it, so. this did well. And it did well. It it uh, it was nominated for an Emmy. Didn't win an Emmy, but um, um, but it did play on PBS uh, over seventy six percent of PBS stations around the country, um, and so it was very popular. And uh, actually, we're doing a showing Ooh. of this. We're doing a showing of this film. I just put a plug. January thirty first up at Nova Southeastern University at the Miniachi Theater. Okay. They're screening the film um, as part of like a, a, an effort you know, to celebrate Davy as cowboy town up there. Oh, that's um, neat. So yeah, I think a lot of people, like you said, a lot of people have no idea. They think of Florida, and Florida is so diverse. And, you know, you got the Florida man, right? The joke of that. I love Florida. But the, yeah, yeah, but then you got to love um, where we're at here in Miami, which is, I mean, I was in L.A. last week, and I'm constantly traveling. And, you know, Miami is now... You know, somebody was, I'm not saying this, but somebody said to me, he's like, Miami is now the L.A. And I'm like, I don't know about that from filming, which we'll get into. But yeah. I do know that the traffic we have is worse than L.A. Right. And it's really turned into something during COVID over the past few years. And yeah. I, um, and uh-oh, there we go. Oh, my gosh, we almost had a had an issue this here was, with our lighter. This is in Polk, Polk City, up in uh, just, mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. west of Disney. And where they, uh, this is a guy named Billy Stokes who has a ranch up there, and he he actually uh, he actually teaches kids, believe it or not, how to ride bulls. Really? Yeah, which is crazy because That's awesome. yeah. you would think there'd be major liability issues. Not in Florida, where they don't. Yeah. But well, it depends. <laughs> I mean, down here in South Florida, the, they're a little bit stricter with that kind of stuff. But you know, Polk City, which is uh, you know near Central Florida, which is, but this is a kid, and I think. It was like six years old. Oh, yeah. Going for his first ride. No, but I, I remember you doing this because, um, you know, we go um, for years going camping and I love, you know, ranches and outside and being out there. And uh, I, I learned a lot about Central Florida with all the, well, like you said, more cowboys than anywhere else. There's an incredibly beautiful areas here in Florida that most people don't see, especially in the, the, the central part of the state if yeah. you go you know basically up us 27 which mm-hmm. when you go up us 27 you don't really see much but there are these incredible incredible just beautiful vistas and ranches and um you know and and really some wonderful people mm-hmm. um and uh you know goes back to a different time in florida um uh and uh, and actually also the uh film celebrates the, the seminoles the seminoles have been cattle ranchers um, ever since the time of the Spanish, they learned cattle ranching from the Spanish, oh, and they were some yeah. of the first cowboys. And w- what I love about, like you just said, the the history of Florida from you, you go like you just started with the, uh, from Key West, and then you go to now what Miami looks like. You go to the other coast, and what a lot of people don't realize is I think everybody from the Northeast migrates to the Miami Boca that area and then everybody from the midwest migrates over to the other side st pete and, sure. and tampa and has a div- florida has so many flavors so you i don't think people realize how many how many how many unique how many unique florida is in so many different pockets from you think of orlando and disney or then you think of the keys and this and the history and the evolution and i i love I, I moved here 20 years, well, after 9-11. Yeah. I was like, I need to be somewhere outside of New York as much as I was a hardcore New Yorker. I said, I just I just need to change. And I love the water, and that's what drew me. But then when I've been here this long, I've been, I'm, I'm in love with Florida and, and everything around it. And you, that's why it's always exciting. That's why I always love talking with you because you have, so, you've, you are, you are Florida. <laughs> And I mean that in the best way possible because you've covered all these projects, like you said, from from that to this and even more. Just the, your, your current one, which congratulations on your Emmy. Thank you very much. I mean, something to be very proud of. You Absolutely. have so many freaking Emmys now. You have to start <laughs> building another rack on the wall or the shelf. But um, so th- so that's what I was going to say. Tell me your journey. Do you ever looking back now, you realize you've made so many different 
Florida projects. Yeah, I mean, I'm a homer uh, when it comes to Florida, obviously. Um, you know, my, my both sides of my family, my father's from Miami, my mom's from Jacksonville. Um, my mom's side goes back to that, uh, the Key West of the 1890s. My dad's side goes back to the 1930s, Miami. We actually had a, they actually had a, a, a office supply store called Barnett's Office Supplies, which was one of the original you know, downtown businesses. And I met your and father before I met you. That's Remember true. Remember that that's crazy story? You were up at FIU at an incubator program. Yes. That's right. And the next thing that's I know, right. I'm like. Actually, my father gave me, yeah, I think gave me your card and said, oh, this guy isn't, he always, you know, says anybody he meets in production. Oh, I met this guy in production. You should call him. I was like, what am I going to call him about? <laughs> he said, well, just call him. So I did. And we talked and, and it's so weird that, you know. I don't know if Luke knows that story. Yeah. We had, we had like a little, you I know, was, yeah. we had a conversation, you know, we we're both like you do production. I do production. Oh, okay, cool. Maybe we'll work together sometime. And, and then years later, kids do came about and, uh, speaking of right through, there through your, your talented son, Luke. Yeah. We got who's yeah. one of the cast members of the show. And uh, not that that was Ozzy. Yeah. And well, speaking of James Patterson, Emmys, all that. I mean, right. So how did so. Um, so actually, let's pause for one sec. Go back. Oh, wait, is this? No, wait, this is the courthouse. This is the the from crossing over. Time. That's what but, I wanted. OK, perfect. So actually, can, let's keep there's playing more kids to stuff later. Yeah, on there. Hit, let's let's keep playing this because so now how did. OK, so you obviously were jumping all around, but this what what. Because I, I I've been watching. Actually, been if she can go back to uh, go back the, the the precinct, the building. So um, actually, in some ways, you you know, this kind of started with kids. Too. That's what I was going to say. Because you filmed. Well, actually, you had a bunch of scenes in so there. So we were doing. We've we were looking for. We uh, you know. So kids do is a, a TV show we did children's you know, TV show for PBS, which was a bunch of sketches. Um, I always called it kind of like Saturday Night Live meets Discovery Channel for Kids. Right. Um, and uh, created by James Patterson. And so we were looking for various venues to do fun sketches and backgrounds. And one of the areas we were looking for was like a courtroom scene and we were looking for a jail cell. And years before this, you know, just in my background is also in TV advertising production. Um, you know, I had known from the Miami Dade Film Office that if you ever needed a jail cell, um, you know, there's this place that was kind of like this black policeman's some type of museum. I didn't really think much of it at the time. I just thought it was just like some kind of fraternal organization. And I never really knew about it until Kid Stu warranted us, you know, looking for a courthouse and a, and a jail cell and that sort of thing. Um, but when in the process of doing the show, I got to sit down with the director of the museum. His name is Terrence Cribbs Laurent, great guy. And, you know, we got to talking and he told me about the history of this. Now, I'm from Miami. Right. And this is a history I didn't even know about. Um, and Overtown, which is, so everybody knows, Overtown is a, a small neighborhood within downtown Miami, which was known as, you know, the black part of town. Uh, originally it was called Colored Town. And not to get too far back into the history, because you can watch the documentary, but essentially when the rail railroad from Flagler was being built along the coastline all the way down eventually towards Key West, um, a lot of the people who built that were black laborers. And they, a lot of them, you know, eventually settled in different areas, whether it's West Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, Miami. Um, and... You know, this was this was right at the uh, end of the 19th century. We're talking the 1890s, um, and it was also on the verge of, you know, really after the time period of Reconstruction, Jim Crow laws coming into to, uh, effect, and essentially, um, you know, all of Florida was a bunch of pioneers, all different backgrounds, all living together. But because of Jim Crow laws and states putting in effectively, you know, racist, you know, laws about separating the races, uh, eventually that meant that, you know, the black people would have to be kind of put in one part of town. And along the coastline, it's interesting because uh, it was always the northwest side of town um, because it's away from the water where all the tourists were going to be, and they wanted to keep people away from the black community. Um, but they still needed a black community to, you know, as a workforce and that sort of thing. So um, anyways, long story short, we can go on about this forever. 
you know, Miami, for all intents and purposes at that time, was a full-on southern town. Uh, a lot of the people who were living in Miami were from the south, from Alabama, Georgia. And, you know, to be quite honest with you, brought a lot of their racist bias mm -hmm. um, and treated black people the way black people were treated throughout the south. On top of that, you had the KKK that had a renaissance uh, in the early 1900s. And the KKK was, you know, kind of a, a lot of uh, the white men in town either joined the KKK or were part of it early on with their own family. And they were a big part of the police department. So a lot of the police department oh. members were in the, in the Klan. And they had parades in downtown Miami and... Uh, they patrol what the years? streets. When was that? This is the early 1900s. Okay. Um, and uh, so by the 1920s is when it was like really full on. Um, and they just treated the black community like crap. Um, and there were homicides and they could basically get away with murder, which they did. Um, but there were various cases, you know, uh, not to get into, you know, again, too much into it because we can go on forever, which I would love to do. But, but we, you know, in, in the late 1920s, there was a case of a young bell, bellhop at a, at a hotel in downtown Miami who he just talked to a white woman and the white woman, you know, called the authorities and said, this black, you know, kid is talking to me. And the police came and took him away and essentially eventually killed him. Um, something that we see today in society. Right. Throughout this time period, um, in Overtown, the at that time called Color Town, people were just kind of beat up and being bullied um, by the police department in Miami, um, and in a lot of the civic groups in my of of this area were asking for better protection, and they you know wanted some form of justice, and they were asking for their own black police officers. So quietly in 1944. Five patrolmen were inducted uh, as part of the Miami City of Miami Police Department, but they were called patrolmen, not policemen, because they weren't given full authority. They could, ah. they could, they could, uh, they could stop someone on the street, but they couldn't make a formal arrest. They had to have a white officer come from downtown to actually make the formal arrest, which was remarkable. But what was interesting, as soon as they started with the five original patrolmen, crime went down like ninety percent because. These were people who were part of the community. People right. knew them. Most of the community were, you know, when it came to the white police officers, were just brought up on trumped up charges um, of, mm. of basic vagrancy or silly things and, you know, put in jail. And they really didn't have an opportunity for justice. So they, they also, this building represented not only the first black police precinct, which that was formed in 1950, but also a courthouse above. So the black community could have, you know, real justice with um, black judges as well, um, because white judges would not adjudicate uh, with black people. They were they weren't. I mean, essentially allowed to go to court. It's 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 really an incredible history here, and it's the only um, precinct and courthouse of its kind in the entire nation, which is pretty incredible. So that kind of just long getting back to it. Long story short. Um, Gave me inspiration. Overtown was always an interesting place for me. I always knew there was a certain character there, but it was always that part of town. People say, oh, you know, we want to yeah. stay out of that town. But people don't realize that this was the Harlem of the South in its heyday in the 1940s and 50s. A lot of entertainers came down here. I mean, it was a hopping place. And, um, you know, but through, uh, you know, uh, gentrification and through uh, the highway being built through Miami kind of destroyed the neighborhood. And, you know, got it to a point. Now we're seeing a renaissance, people kind of appreciating its story and its background. But essentially, so I created a documentary called Crossing Over Town. And it essentially talks about that entire story um, from, from the beginning, Miami's very beginnings to um, kind of through the 1980s. But what was interesting about this project is the fact that Miami kind of became a role model in terms of community policing, in terms of understanding that police aren't there just to, <clears throat> you know, uh, look out for crimes. They're there to be a part of the community, to right. be a resource for the community. And so in that way, Miami kind of became an innovator in terms of policing, especially in communities of color. Um, and uh, she can go ahead and, and play the video if you want to see yeah, that's other parts of it. But those were the original five patrolmen. 
and it's just an incredible story. So drone shot. Did you take anybody out on that? (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because now looking back, you know, we did Kid Stew there before I did this documentary. Right. I've been, we've, and we did, we did, you know, the Godfather scene there. Mm-hmm. We did the, the courtroom scene. And I mean, we did a whole bunch of different, you know, sketches there. Now I feel kind of bad because for me now, understanding the story of this place, it's, it's like the sacred space. And we were doing, you know, a fun little entertaining kid right show there. there in that, in that courtroom. Luke it, fell yeah. off that many times. Yeah. Was, wow. And actually, if you'll see there, right here, well, people can't see it, but there's a picture of there of some white men, and actually they were Jewish judges. The Jewish judges were willing to um, work at the black courtroom, so, and uh, and that, that meant a lot to me. I mean, my background, I'm Jewish, right. and, and so that meant a lot to me to see that um, the Jewish judges actually, because they couldn't get any white judges to come there to adjudicate, but the Jewish judges had no problem doing that. So, and there's there's always been an interesting tie between the Jewish community and the black community. One of the reasons Hollywood came to be was because, you know, back in the time of Edison, when he was uh, when you had the first film cameras and all that happening, you know, Jews weren't allowed to be a part of that process. So there was this new place called Hollywood Land mm-hmm. out west, and some people had the idea that you know you could create films that you could broadcast on a screen and sell tickets to. And Edison, for his, you know, for all his genius, said, "Oh, that's not going to work." Right. He wanted to do the Nickelodeons, where you just look in a little, you know, box and see a film moving. Um, and it happened to be a large part of the Jewish community that started in Hollywood with the idea of making mm-hmm. the movie business something that you know you could bring to the masses on the big screen. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's a it's a really great, fascinating history, and uh, you know, it's in. This this ended up being on PBS. We we actually didn't know if it, how well it would do on PBS uh, across the nation. You know, we we distributed it nationally, right? Um, and in the end, it got eighty six percent carriage rate, meaning eighty six percent of all wow. the over two hundred forty PBS stations PBS stations, um, you know, have have played this film at one time or another. Um, and we just won a couple Emmys for it as well. I know. With, Congratulations, with local, local NAFTA. So so. How long did it um, take you to put this together? This, I mean, you know, from the research and putting everything together, it's probably like a year and a half. Okay. Uh, um, that's not, which that's is, which pretty, is pretty quick yeah. for a documentary. But, um, you know, I tend uh, to just, once I get going on a documentary, I just go full bore on it. And, uh, and, and, and one of the great things about Miami is you'll see a lot of archival footage here. We have the Wolfson archives um, as part of Miami-Dade. Uh, they have an incredible... Uh, 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 you know, reservoir of, of video footage um, from all the way from the early part of the 20th century up to the present day. Um, and uh, that little fort right there is yeah. one of the original, it's called Fort Dallas, one of the original buildings. It was built as a slave quarters here in Miami. Oh, wow. And it's, you can see it on Loomis Park on the New River, uh, not on the, New, the Miami River. Um, and uh, so, you know, it was, it was, this was a re- probably one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Oh, you, um, I can see, I can see in your eyes the, pro- the pride in that. And absolutely, yeah, that's no, amazing. No, that was uh, and, and, uh, a lot of fun. So, wow, and um, and th- this is just like uh, this is just various footage from stuff I've worked on. No, that's amazing. I um, making films, and as you've started and gone through all these different uh, transitions or pieces periods that you've kind of, you, you like you said, you saw something, you jumped at it. You spent a year and a half researching it. You put it out, and you you said something about the pickup rate. Because what I what I think is interesting is um, there are a lot of people who make films or pro, let's just say projects, something like that, but they don't know how to get them out there. And with the PBS, and you said the pickup rate. Explain to people because a lot of people may not know traditional broadcast and let's use PBS as because only because you just really went through this very recently post COVID and all that explain to everybody kind of what, or explain what that means. I I understand from us talking and all that. Well, you know, the, the public television model is different from other models. Um, 
and and now everything's very different because of streaming and the popularity of streaming. But we still have over the air broadcast television, now, what is which that? these kids out there probably you don't know. You don't first know explain about. the antennas that yes, they've seen on the TV. Exactly. And the foil exactly. And the yeah, no one realizes you can get free TV if you just get an antenna, what? attach it to your TV, and there's still over-the-air channels. Public television it's, television is just that. It's television that's meant for everybody, um, and that's where, of course, we had our, our show Kids Do, um, and, uh, and actually, you know, you would wonder, like, something I found, unfortunately, over the years uh, working on this kids show, which has an educational component, is a lot of the other, you know, uh, big companies, whether it's Nickelodeon, Viacom, Sony, um, Disney, it's interesting. They don't want educational content, which, and so PBS is kind of like one of the last bastions of places where you can have entertainment that's also educational. Um, so that's why the, the PBS model worked for us for kids too. Um, but essentially, uh, typically, the way shows get made for public television is uh, you have all the various stations in every city. There's usually a PBS station, and they create some of their own programs and content. Um, but a lot of the programs that come are from independent producers. So the perfect example being Ken Burns. Ken Burns creates these great historical documentaries. Um, you know, you, you get funding. That's a whole other thing we'll talk about. But essentially, you create a project. And as long as it's within the guidelines of how, you know, the, the criteria for PBS television, um, you know, you, you have a good chance if it's good material and it's, you know, the production's done well, you can get it on public television because they're looking for content. But one of the things that people don't know is that um, when you're watching PBS, um, even though there's national broadcasts like the Civil War at the same time around the nation, Typically, most PBS broadcasts are all independent on each station, and each station has its own programming. So if you create a program and it airs on a local station and you have, you know, the relationship with the station, you can present it at entities like there's an entity called uh, American Public Television, which is kind of a clearinghouse for public television. And so every throughout the year and also at one time uh, in November, typically, they have a big conference where all the PBS broadcasters get together and they take a look at the shows and they see what's on offer from the local stations, or even some independents can get in there and show what they have. Um, but typically, there's no money involved. It's, it's kind of an exchange program where it's it basically the way that you get funding for most public television is from, you know, uh, sponsors, foundations, um, people who, you know, want to put money towards the show. Um, but all of these uh, PBS programmers get together and they... Uh, essentially vote on the shows that they all agree should have the potential to go national. Um, and in order to get that, out of the 240 stations, whatever it is, you need at least 25 votes to, you know, get the minimum to go national. So when you say a quarter, the broadcasters yes. have to say yes. Not even a quarter, 25, which is out of 240. Oh, 25, yeah. not 25%, yeah. 25 yeah. Yeah. of the stations. Yeah, 25 of the stations. And like Crossing Overtime, we were like just hoping to find out if we got 25 or 26. And um, I forget how many we had, but we had over 200 uh, that signed on for it. You know, that's what the, which we call the, and the carriage is what they, carriage means they carry the program. So mm -hmm. we had 86% carriage. So we're real happy about that. Actually, Kids Do had 76% carriage. So even wow. <laughs> Overtown was incredible, the kind of response that it had. Right. Um, and so, I mean, just to give an idea of typically for public television, you know, you have to make a program within the guidelines of PBS. It has to be, when I say a 30-minute program, it has to be a 26, whatever, right. and then when it, the hour long has to be 56 or 58, depending on because the know. network needs their stingers. Yeah, on both yeah. Ends. So there's a yeah. specific time you have to make a documentary, and I see a lot of people will make a two hour long feature, and they don't format it down to an hour. PBS will take a two hour long feature, but it has to be something really remarkable because typically they they like to work in either 30 minute or hour long blocks. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to if you have the intention of making a documentary and you want to get on PBS, you have to kind of think in your head you got to hit that hour mark um, right on the dot and and then 
you know, in terms of funding. No, they don't pay you. They don't. They don't pay you. I mean, uh, sometimes a station will, could be a co-production, and they'll be a part of the fundraising. Uh, Kids Do was an example of that. Kids Do was a co-production between James Patterson, the author, and South Florida PBS, and there was, you know, the foundations involved with money, along with some of the dollars from Patterson himself. Uh, you know, education was very important for him. Do you think that, um, cause talking about crossing Overton, um, you obviously that wasn't by the network. You did that. Yeah. So, and, and then with Patterson, do you think it was his name that helped get the funding from the local network or was it? You well, think the he, Patterson already had a relationship with South Florida PBS. Oh, so. so he had, he actually had done a document, a serious documentary about Bell, Bell Glade about a little girl who was murdered in Belle Glade. He won an Emmy for that uh, many years ago. Okay. Um, so in, in over the years, he's had a relationship with PBS, and I think when he wanted to do the show, he, he naturally uh, reached out to them and said, I want to do the show. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how Kids Do came about. So how did you so, get pulled in a kid? So give, give us that. Give, for those who don't know. You well, know, this, is just, this is just, you know, I would love to say, you know, I was chosen out of various people to be a part of this. And <laughs> in some ways I was, but ultimately it really is just like everything in the film business. It's who you're working with and networking. So I had been working for years with a director named Frank Cosentini um, in the advertising business. Um, he's a Madison Avenue guy. And he actually, most people don't know, James Patterson himself used to be in the advertising business. He was the global head creative director for J. Walter Thompson worldwide um, back in the, in the 90s. And then he decided, uh, he wrote his first novel and that was his success. And he eventually, you know, kind of quit the advertising industry and he did all right for himself, I think, as an author. He <laughs> sold, sold, sold a couple more books after that. A few. A few books. Does um, he still hold the title as like? The, I think he, uh, at least in I the think the few. only, the only uh, book that has, outsold James Patterson's whole portfolio was the Bible. Okay. So, so yeah. but yeah, he's, he's, so you know, just under the Bible. Yes, he's, yes. So he's got something to, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. He's a, you know, best selling author around the world. And, and actually most people don't know this, but he's also, he was always uh, up at the top of uh, children's authors as well. He wrote a lot of middle grade books and younger books, but middle grade was kind of the area that he worked on. And, um, you know, and I think that's why kids do was kind of geared towards middle grade kids um, which I happen to love because there's a that that time in life that age is a wonderful age because kids are like intelligent they know what's going on but they're still having fun and they still haven't got into the you know the 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 world issues the, <laughs> well the you know the the that puberty age where things are changing and they change their you know emotional state you know changes drastically so so that demographic of kids essentially from eight to like you know 12 13 you know is just a fun stage and one of the great things about kids too is we were able to make it a little snarky um and have some fun with it and the kids had a lot of fun doing it um and in fact there was one kid luke nappy i remember who luke nappy was, mm. was one of the kids on kids doesn't Park. doesn't doesn't ring a bell i don't know maybe oh, really? he's shaking his head he's saying no no but we had we had so much fun, and and when we cast the kids, they were all you know right around what ten years old, most of them, uh, ten or eleven. And uh, there's one you missed though. And, and Jay, <laughs> she's, she, but over, she's looking at her. But she did Jade, come back to do the auditions. Jade, Jade, <laughs> Jade was. We were just talking. Jade was was actually she was on our list, and she was just a little bit older than the age group we were looking for. So. You know, that's your fault for having her too early. It's my, I, you yes. know what? I'm going to give you a funny story then. So since you said that, I'll let, oh, was, there you go. So uh, a few, uh, just recently I had Herschel uh, Faber, who is the chair or he, one of the heads of New York Film Academy. So Herschel from New York Film Academy um, and how I met him. It's funny. I'm starting to see a correlation of me riding my son and daughter's coattails. Um, now, that being said, there was a casting. And they he they said you know the kids headed over to New York Film Academy and it was for Luke and Luke walks in and come then here comes uh, Herschel because he's casting his movie that he's making and then he turns around and he sees Jade he goes no you come in and read 
So Jade just off the sofa goes in and because the kids are prepped, they have monologues, they have all this sort of stuff. She reads, he comes back and he's like, you know, he calls and he's like, Luke's the, Luke's the part. And he goes, and Jade's like, and uh, Jade's kind of like, huh, okay, I wonder why. And he's like, no, no, Jade's incredible, but she would be playing his love interest. And we're like, oh, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> that won't work out. <laughs> That's too weird, yeah. you know, when you're, yeah. uh, so he's like, but we wanted her so bad. That so would test poor, your acting chops for yeah, sure. Yeah, so Jade has been, uh, that's happened more than once to Jade now, and she's very angry. She's like, why am I not the younger sibling instead right. of the older sibling? Right. But now at this age, it's working out very well because she still looks extremely young and she's, uh, you know, in her teen, late teens now. But and uh, and uh, actually, I will say this Jade. just on a serious note: both Luke and Jade are great actors, both of them. Um, I was, you know, they How both. How much did that cost me? They both, they <laughs> both have extremely natural talent for for. Well, they grew up in the industry, so hopefully, yeah. And it, you know, it skips a generation, so clearly it doesn't happen here. So. Yeah. Uh, and and overall, we, I mean, we got lucky on kids too. I mean, uh, there was when we first were doing the casting. Um, there were a lot of doubters that said, well, you're not going to find the kids here in Florida. They, you know, you got to go to L.A., you got to get the Disney Nickelodeon kids. I think if you watch most of the Disney Nickelodeon kids, I think they're over the top in terms of the way they, I mean, they're probably directed that way. Right, to be, that, to be extra. Oh, the, my yeah, gosh, yeah. melodramatic and, like, overly, you know, like... Uh, Telenovela for children. Bubble gum, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and, and Kids Stew was interesting because it, it required some serious acting chops. Um, and we were all, you know, I mean, I always, you know, being in the, in the, in the industry down here, the film industry, I always knew that, you know, we always had good talent down here. Um, and, uh, but the kids were phenomenal. They knocked it out of the park. I mean, just, you know, more than what normally we saw with a lot of child actors at the time. And how do you teach that to a 10 year old? I mean, right. how do, how does, you know, it's, it's amazing, uh, the kind, and I think, Probably because it was an ensemble cast, mm -hmm. that kind of brought everybody's level up. You know, it'd be interesting to see if we did that show with just like two kids and we did sketches with just two kids, like for instance. Right. But right. I think there's something about it being an ensemble and, you know, kind of each other pushing each other. And it wasn't competitive, um, but there's definitely something people had to, you know, they had to study their lines and they had to, you know, and and it was fast paced too. That that's the other part of it, yeah. was the fact that you know a lot of times they only had you know a short amount of time to learn the scripts, plus along you know whatever direction they were given. So it was kind of like Saturday Night Live in that sense, as it, a lot of it were sketches that they had really short time period to work on. Um, but they it was just you know they just really knock it out of the park. Really. I mean, th that was a highlight of my career. I think so we far. have some footage, Jade, if you guys hit, uh, but it's funny you say that with the, with watching the kids all kind of at that age, um, kind of grow. And, um, I think, Oh, jump ahead a little bit. I think we keep scanning and there, Oh, go back a little. No, oh, no, go forward, oh, forward go, go forward. There's a, a kid's stew area in there somewhere. Oh, there, there you go. Too far. There, there you is. go. And hit play. There it is. Oh, speaking of Luke, there you go. But um, but it's interesting because, like you said, they were all at a certain age, and I, like you said, they all leveled up together because they saw each one doing it yeah. and they wanted it. And I mean, how many? Well, for perfect example, how many Emmys did the show win? I guess we won a total of uh, nine. Nine Emmys. Nine Emmys. Yeah. In three seasons. So, yeah. So that says so. that speaks volumes right there yeah. for the whole thing. Absolutely. And everybody. Um, and it was you know. Um, and I can say this because I happen to know the, some of the one of, more than one of the kids. One of them just popped up there. She was at the house the other day for Christmas, and they all still talk. And yeah. so it's really cool what you put together and found talent that is, um, you know, you see some kids who jump into, like you said, you, well, let me back up. Florida, I look at a lot, and I'd love to talk about the history of this because you you'll say it, you'll know it better than I am. But I say Florida is a very look and book. How you look is how you book down yeah, here. Yeah, but it was you, a model oriented community, one hundred percent. And yeah. that wasn't the case back when they had Miami Vice and there was all this stuff going on. And I'm hoping to get Ellen Jacoby on here and some of the other ones who've been, even even Miami well, Vice. Honestly, a lot of those were L.A. people who came into town. That's what I'm, so so yeah. Miami's had. Um, <sighs> People love to come here. 
and film for a day. Yeah. And then they'll go film in Atlanta and everywhere else. And they'll right. be like, oh, it was, the whole thing was shot in Miami. No, it was like two days. Yeah. And when you did this show here and you had that compressed schedule and you had a real production, to say the least, um, and finding the talent and all this, it, it, it had to have been for you as somebody producing and making sure this actually got on the networks uh had it been a bit of a challenge in the beginning but then when everybody saw it well give me give me your journey on this that we didn't see yeah i mean i always knew that we had talent down here and and you're right that it was a model focused community there's a lot of photo shoots uh, that are popular down here miami being you know a, a warm weather destination um back when i was kind of starting in the industry back in the 90s this was the hot place for the modeling industry. So the entire modeling industry kind of moves around the world. And in the 90s, Miami Beach was their world. After that, they moved to like Johannesburg or mm -hmm. other places. Now, Japan, who knows where. Right. But, um, but definitely it was a, a model type world. But, you know, there was always somewhat of an acting industry here in terms of real theater acting, that style of acting. Um, you know, there's some, you know, various theater productions. Um, but, you know, I mean, honestly, also, we didn't we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, you know, I hadn't worked on a kid show before this time period. We've worked with kids, obviously, on various productions, a lot of commercial productions. But to do a, a, a full 30 minute show and multiple shows, um, you know, we, we didn't know where it was going to go. But, you know, we did a full casting and uh, we found, you know, the great kids that we found. Um, and. Uh, you know, and we had our writer was a guy named Brian Sitz, who's still writing out there. He writes a lot with Patterson as well. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of just great material. Um, and we just went at it. We just, you know, went full bore, you know, and, you know, sourcing all the locations and all of the production resources. And Miami has always had great production resources. Um, I always say that, you know, every every town pretty much around the United States has some kind of production community. Um, but there, you know, you go to some of the smaller towns like in the Carolinas or what have you, there's, there's like what I call the, uh, the a crew. There's like a main, you know, set of people that do most of the productions and, you know, and maybe there's one or two levels of depth of there's your jail. I just saw yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt. The, I just no? caught my eye. Speak, continue, please. So speaking of there's the so, jail. So, yeah. you know, obviously LA, the depth of LA in terms of a crews, meaning like top mm -hmm. professionals, you know, that's got to have like, at least, I, I mean, I don't know, 200 right. levels of a crew people because it's LA probably more than that. Um, but Miami actually, you know, you could go, uh, I think relatively speaking 20 or 30 deep in terms of, you know, a level crews. So mm -hmm. we haven't, we've always had a very strong production industry down here and it wasn't just from Miami vice. Remember we had flipper and, and, Actually, uh, the original, um, uh, some of the original films from the early 1900s were, you know, filmed in, in Jacksonville. Um, D.W. Griffith, uh, who was, you know, known as right. one of the first filmmakers, Birth of a Nation, which is a, basically right. shows <laughs> the, the Ku Klux Klan. Um, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of these things were filmed in, in North Florida. Jacksonville was actually going to be the film capital of the whole United States until there was a, a Baptist minister who put the kibosh on it and said, no, we don't want that here. We don't want that industry here, you know, and uh, that's how L.A. kind of came to be. But Miami, warm weather destination, always been popular, um, you know, for filming. And but definitely Miami Vice in the 1980s kind of got the whole series things going. And then there's, you know, various films that have been down here uh, over the years. So we always had a pretty strong production industry. Um, with a lot of professionals learning the business. Um, and uh, now, you know, one of my gripes is the fact that we don't have as much people apprenticing in the business anymore. It used to be if you wanted to work as a crew member, as a gaffer, learn the business. Whatever, you learn the business, you got to do it by experience. But, you know, because of the democratization of technology, you know, every kid that gets even not even going to film school, but every kid gets their own camera and wants to start shooting stuff. But, right. I would say that, especially for the younger generation, there's a lot you learn by working with veterans and professionals to get to that next level. Because what ends up happening is a lot of kids get cameras and they say, oh, I can do this. I'm going to do mm -hmm. my own stuff. 
you know, they end up nothing against it, but they end up doing wedding videos, bar mitzvah videos, right. and they kind of get stuck in that kind of corporate world of, you know, local productions. But if they want to get to the next level of TV series and movies and higher end film production, you really have to ingratiate yourself in that part of the industry and network with those people. So you kind of have to take a bite of that humble pie. I mean, I went to four years of college and, you know, film school. And when I got out of college, the first thing I was doing was walking dogs and making coffee there you um, go. Yeah. and just paying the dues and just started working as a production assistant. And production <clears throat> assistant is the, one of the best ways to learn the industry because you learn from all the different crew members what they're all doing and you kind of find things that you like. So. Well, we still had to walk Frank's dog on. And you still have to walk. I, I, I just sit there with the green screen of the things and I think there's a picture of me with you, with you walking in and yeah. turning your head going, there's me, Frank, your wife, and, yes. we're, and I got, got a green screen thing. And you just looked and went, and turned and walked out of the other room. And I was like, "Yeah, don't ask this one." Like, it's... but we did put a we did we did put a GoPro on Ozzy, so Ozzy became a cameraman as well. Yeah, so you got credit for that. I hope on this. So, uh, but yeah, it's 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 like you said. You I, there's never been a set that I've not learned something. Yeah, and, and I think that's the thing where you, if you grew up in the industry, you can appreciate and you always learn something, whether yeah. it's good or bad. Yeah. Um, by watching and being in a collaborative group where today, like you just said, I see a lot of, um, I'm not, I don't want to say influencers or content creators, but they're so, um, they, they get a few million views and they're holding their phone and they're so used to doing it their way that right. then when it's time to try and do a different move, it's kind of like you met a karate, you learn one great punch with Turn right. your wrist and this, and right. then that's your only move. Yeah. That's I don't know how that makes you. Where you know we all, if you understand the whole. Well, I equate I equate um, TikTokers to, uh -oh. to bodybuilders. No. Have you ever seen a bodybuilder? Typically, they're they're big and they're strong, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But their legs are little tiny spindly <laughs> things. Why? Because on TikTok, everybody it's just the upper body. So that's upper it. body doing a dance, but they don't use their legs. And that's you know? it. So that's so your the, quote. So they're like, you Two know. Two old guys here talking about this yes, is the next yes. generation of content. <laughs> but then you can throw that all out the window because, you know, somebody just, you know, gets picked up on TikTok and makes a million dollars and, oh, yeah. and, you know, make more money than we ever will in our entire lives right. just from doing their own, you know. But, you know, it's, it's you know, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, is interesting because when YouTube first came, actually, here's the ironic thing. I think. I have something, uh, when, I forget when YouTube first came out. Was that I 2007, say 2007? Right, yeah, right. Around and, and 2005, they were out of, uh, 2006. Another coast of Florida here. So I actually, ironically enough, I did the rodeo thing. One of the first things I ever filmed was a, a bull at the Davy Rodeo Arena down here. And the guy got thrown up off the bull or whatever. And I posted it to YouTube and just to see how it would work. I mean, it was really crappy little video back at that time. And I posted it to YouTube and, you know, it wasn't anything special. It was just something you could post videos to. And I thought immediately, this YouTube thing doesn't work. This isn't going to be anything. This is just like, you know, you post it and that's it. I mean, you just have a video online, big deal. So, but ironically enough, I think a lot of the, I mean, we have to get into social media talk, but I mean, a lot of, a lot of the people who are successful in social media were were first out the gate and that's one of the reasons you know they created a following when nobody wanted to do that this is right. you know nobody <laughs> wanted to in our industry in the film industry we had to make a living mm -hmm. make money for our families and originally some of the very first social media people they didn't make any money at all they just you know started building they just did it constantly building up a platform and nobody thought there was ever going to be money in that right um so a lot of those people that were first you know out the gate um, were the people who were early on very successful in that world. And, uh, you know, if you said a, a, a Kim Kardashian who's, you yeah. know, never done any content would be as popular as she is. If we were investors and someone mm -hmm. said, hey, so this is my daughter <laughs> and she's just going to be posting about what she had for breakfast and where she's going that day, you and I would say, "What? It's silly. Yeah, who's like, going to watch that?" Right. Um, but you know, that's the world that we're in now. Yeah. You know, so and it's changed. Let's let's because you just said something and you hit a few buttons that I want to talk about and I want to come back to. Let's talk about where what from your perspective where things have gone because 
I'm looking here at Kids 2 Kids, and I've seen some of them. Uh, they've all magically, when I say magically, stayed in the industry because we know how hard it is. But uh, Cobra Kai, uh, one of them just did a movie with Adam Sandler. I've got my son back here who's done a bunch of different projects. You know, someone just dropped on Amazon, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, a lot of these kids um, are still creating big projects. They've gone to do big projects. Then you've got um, the the group that I will say um, from that, I'm using the, that age generation, today's late teens or whatever it is. And the number one job everybody says is I want to be an influencer. I want to be a content creator. Right. And I look and I go, okay, what is exactly, what does that mean per se? Right. And I look at what you just said between telling a story versus doing a dance versus all these different things. And where do you see, because like you and I just, you just said it, like I never would have thought, you know, eating my breakfast and, you know, come, come spend five minutes with me was a thing. Reality TV came right. in because of the strike. That's a whole story for a different reason. But, but where do you see things going? Because if you think about it, only in the past few years, even just coming, you know, out of COVID and then just the strike, we're kind of just getting back to work. If you think of it as an industry um, from a few years ago. And since then, the streaming, TikTok, all that has changed yeah. dramatically. And YouTube, now Mr. Beast, the number one, you know, more views than some of the biggest movies out there and that have ever been produced. So where where do you, as a as a, somebody who makes content, as a producer, where do you see this going? Yeah, I well, I think it's, you know, different flavors uh, for different audiences. And, uh, you know, there's just some people who are interested in social media and TikTok, and that's their form of entertainment. That's their form of content. Other people make maybe like long form. They like, you know, streaming um, or a combination of those things. Obviously, uh, you know, we're bombarded with so much um, media that, you know, sometimes I wonder you get so caught up in on your TikTok feed that you're not, you know, able to explore other things out there because you just get so caught up in wanting to see what your friends are doing and that sort of thing. Um, I, you know, I, honestly, I think it just comes down to authenticity. I think that's ultimately uh, whatever you're working on. Um, you know, I'm not going to deride social media because it's a form of entertainment and it works. Obviously, it works right. very well. Um, you know, I was brought up in the traditional uh, storytelling process of building up to some kind of climax, you know, long story that builds up to a climax. And, uh, you know, when I first started doing social media, you know, the people of Google would be telling me, we need the explosion up front right. because we need, we need, we need to we need catch, catch the, the viewer in that, in that split second that they have a chance whether they're going to watch it or not. And it went against everything that I was taught in terms of storytelling. The um, Hitchcock, the slow boil. Well, yeah. You know, yeah. tell me about, yeah. The, the health... three, the three act play. Right. Um, but it's interesting because I think people want both things because, People will watch TikTok, but then they'll also go and, and binge a show and stay up till four in the morning, you know, watching uh, an incredible TV show. I will say one of the things that's changed is TV is now, I think, at a point kind of a lot of the TV programs have surpassed films in terms of, you know, uh, their 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 own influence. Um, and, you know, I think uh, I couldn't tell you the future because it's always changing. And in fact, I have three daughters and I tell my daughters all the time, you know, uh, you may be working in something in the future that hasn't been invented yet. Right. So, you know, who knows, who knew there were, I mean, when I was growing up, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have a media tablet that we were looking at stuff, you know, uh, on, you know, for our entertainment. Um, so that became a whole industry. And so there will be new things out there. Um, you know, you know, everybody, the watchword today is AI. Um, oh. I don't, I don't think I can't, I can't make a judgment good or bad about it. I think there's some useful features of AI that will help content. Um, you know, I mean, there might be things that people don't have a budget for that AI will help them create the content they need to tell a story. So why not? All right. Um, but will that also that take away some of the creativity that we see? Yeah, we are. But 
some, you know, with AI, you know, that content that AI is using comes from somewhere. So there are creators out there somewhere that have um, built you know, the foundation, building for the foundation. That's absolutely. Because so. I'm looking at this commercial and all the different groups made me think of the, the when you did the show, you, you look at these short sound bites. And I almost think that this show, because I know how great it was. And, and I say that from people who have seen it, but not just me and the Emmys, but it was it fit this. You hit a window where if you posted these on TikTok, they would go super viral because yeah. they're very creative and funny and all that. And but this was right before that. And then it was right. You were in this window. Tell me what you because 10 years sooner or 10 years before that, this would have been the Mickey Mouse Club or right. for those that know. Right. So do you think that there's a timing element as well in society to shows? And yeah. I mean, I, to be perfectly honest, since the show was on PBS and kids not a lot of kids are watching PBS. I think a lot of people have uh, missed the opportunity to actually see it to some extent um, because uh, typically this show would be seen by kids who are maybe sitting at home and their parents just put on channel, you know, their their PBS, local PBS channel and this would pop on. But, you know, the the caveat out of that being that it was on at a particular time and you don't know necessarily when it was on. I mean, you know, different stations would put it on regularly on a weekend and Sunday, Saturday, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, but this age demographic is one of the most difficult ones, the middle grade, because, right. you know, they're online with all of their media. That's really the main area that they're on. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, uh, we actually posted uh, most of the segments on YouTube. So you can go to Kids Do TV on YouTube and you can see a lot of the segments. But we never had to put a big emphasis on, on boosting the social media. And maybe we should have, um, and, it was uh, right at, or too early, you know, yeah. it was a win, we, weird window timing wise. What did you, so as I'm watching, uh, Luke here and there and seeing him on both sides with the mustache and there it is. We, tell me what was the biggest surprise for you doing? Like, you know, you go into a project I've been, you know, and then you kind of go and you leave it and you go, wow, that was something you found different so what what going into this with your expectations and having all the experience you've done what was the biggest surprise for you if you will <laughs> was it um, a, a, you know the biggest surprise something i talked about earlier was <clears throat> um the kids the the kids talent um, yeah you know like i said i knew that you know kids could pull off the sketches but I didn't know the phenomenal talent these kids would be because these kids were hitting their marks on every take. I mean, we 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 actually didn't do a lot of, if I remember, I mean, we, we had a really <clears throat> ambitious schedule and um, we were shooting, you know, many sketches throughout the day. Oh yeah. Um, you know, that, that was, <laughs> huh. that was, that was me as the, <laughs> as the dryer, slave driver of the kids because, you know, I'm as a producer, I was always about efficiency and trying to maximize time. So, you know, we had the kids, you know, for a particular amount of days. So I wanted to do as much as I can in one day. So, yeah. you know, we had kids filming over here, one scene and kids over there filming another scene. And it was just like, you know, get them in. And it was like, like a Saturday Night Live where the kids, you know, would have to run off and change costumes and go into another segment, get their lines down as quick as they could and, uh, and get into it. But, um, that was the biggest surprise was them hitting their marks was just, you know, I can't say enough about the kids on the show because they were just, they, they, they blew it out of the park. I mean, they, I, that was the most impressive thing for me. Um, so, you know, we were really excited about that. And a lot of great, I mean, watching it all come together behind the scenes, I'm hoping uh, I'll find maybe if I can find, God knows we filmed a lot of behind the scenes. I did. And I'll uh, maybe I can find some of it and we'll get your approval and we'll put a f link below. Actually, and if she, if she goes towards the end, there's some behind the scenes there. <laughs> oh, of the kids all early right. On. We may have to jump to the behind the scenes. We'll scroll ahead in a second here and get to the. Uh, we'll, uh, keep going. I think away. How far at the end? There it is. This is behind the scenes. Yeah, so people can get a feeling of how big and what it really entailed. A lot. This yeah. wasn't just a. You know, a lot of people I think think sometimes these pr projects are. You know, three well, or four, yeah. Also, I think, you know, I know the kids didn't actually take it for granted, but to have an opportunity to do this at that age, oh, uh, yeah. to have a show like this, and not just like, oh, I'm doing one segment. You know, a lot of kids down here are used to doing commercials. Right. And so they go in a day and they do their commercial and, you know, but this was 
sketch after sketch after sketch and just, you know, extremely demanding uh, for these kids to uh, do all these things. But I think it was a, a lot of fun, obviously, um, for everybody involved. And, you know, we just had a blast. Uh, Frank, too, as you can see. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Not as much fun for you, though. Being in the being in the producer chair. Oh, I loved it. Did no, you? oh, absolutely. I mean, like your name, chaos is what I is what I live on. That's um, right. The more complicated a production is, the more fun I have. Mm -hmm. I I like the challenge. I do too. And so, you know, so instead of planning for like a one day shoot, um, I actually love you know weeks of shooting where I have to put the whole strategy and production together and try and fill all the puzzle pieces to take advantage of. We're going to be filming at this look. I mean, you know, we're choosing locations and for sketches and, you know, like at the Black Precinct Museum, you know, there were multiple sketches we were doing there. So, you know, we did the courtroom scene for one thing and the jail scene for another and another room for the Godfather. Um, and uh, so it's just for me as a producer, you know, it's always putting the puzzle pieces together is, is what I have the most fun with. And and that really, you know, that high energy level. Um, I thrive on that for sure. What do you now c contrast that? Cause as we're watching all this and then you have a, um, a, a documentary where I'm assuming what was your crew on that? Nothing. The, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. Yeah. So I mean, have I have me and a cameraman and sound guy, but you know, it's, it's, it's a lot different. Yeah. Um, and, and, a, and a documentary and, a, and one of the reasons that, um, you know, most of the documentary stuff, I shoot most of the stuff myself because, it's such a long period of time to get a little tidbit here, a little tidbit there, you know, have to go and do a drone shot early in the morning somewhere. And I'm not going to get a whole crew and do that. I go and, you know, fly my drone and just do that shot as part of that B roll. And then, you know, another day I have the opportunity to interview somebody, an interview might come up like that. So you don't have time to prepare. So, um, luckily I have the benefit of, you know, uh, you know, knowing how to shoot and edit myself which helps a lot. Um, now, I would love to be able to, on a documentary, have a full crew um, and, you know, bring up the quality to a different level. But, um, you know, but in order to get a documentary done and with the kind of, you know, funds it takes to create a documentary, you know, a lot of that you have to do on your own. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a whole different animal for sure because you're, you're more living in your mind doing it on your own um, as opposed to a, an ensemble show like this with a, you know, cast and crew of 60 people, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of components there. So in production, you know, I think probably the one talent that I do have is being able to scale small or large. And that, I'd say that comes from an experience as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you can't, you just like, that's why I was getting at that. I think a lot of people... Um, you know, because when you watch something, you don't really see a lot of the behind the scenes and how many people. So you think, oh, you right. know, and that's where I think a lot of like where we go to the YouTube stuff and all that. And I think now with like you see some of these like Mr. Beast, since I was re referencing him earlier, he's got an entire crew. I mean, he's a whole production company. And then you've got some who are just it's a camera and they're vlogging themselves. Right. So there's a very different style and a prediction. I wouldn't say production quality, but there's something that comes across that way is a yeah. little more polished or a little yeah. more. And uh, and I think documentary is a craft more so. And oh, when, yeah, no, it's all craft. Um, it's 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 you know it's different genres. One of the things I've been extremely lucky to do is to work in various dramas, whether it be you know uh, you know entertainment content like this or documentaries, music videos, um, you know even TV commercials, whatever it is. Um, I've had the benefit of working in different genres, and you know. Even doing stuff like 360 or you know mm -hmm. new new media, um, you know so so you have to learn a lot of different things and uh, you know that's always been a big balance in my life of you know do you want to be the jack of all trades mm -hmm. or master of none you know that whole concept so I think all in all you know real you know to be successful you do kind of have to focus on a certain area um, sometimes to. I don't know. It, it's tough to say because I've worked in a lot of different right. genres and I've had success. But, you know, I think I think it goes back to what I was saying, authenticity. And, you know, if you are going to do a certain project, you have to be into it full bore um, and you have to understand it and you have to, you know, work at it. I mean, it's it's there's a lot of uh, time and research that goes into uh, certain projects. You can't just jump in and, um, 
you know, I couldn't jump in and do a movie tomorrow. I would have to, you know, get my mind around it. Um, you know, and in fact, most people who do films, you know, they work for years before they even get to the production side of it. Absolutely. You know, they work, they could work for two or three years prepping the film. We were just talking uh, earlier about uh, the the new film by uh, Bradley Cooper, Maestro. Right. From my understanding, I forget what it was, but I think he's been working on trying to get that made for like seven or eight years, if not more. You know, it was a project that he's been working on. So, um, but in order, you know, as a producer, by the time you get to production, you know, you did all your work in the prep, you know. So when you get to the product, like usually when I get to the productions of these mm -hmm. things on the day of production, I'm pretty much done with my job. I mean, I'm there and and trying to, you know, put out fires as necessary. Right. But Execute because you already have your plan. My job is to set it all up and to hit the button to execute because you have all these great film professionals and actors. They're ready to do their thing and, you know, if you can communicate what everybody needs to do, um, you know, and what their role is and what they're supposed to do, everybody knows what their role is. If, if that's done well and everybody understands that, then that's how you have a successful production, but it's all, it's all in the prep. And so most times if people see me on a set on a production like this and they see me the day of production, they say, what's that guy do? He's just standing there. <laughs> Well, but, you know, I, I have to pay you a huge compliment because something I learned early on, and this I think this applies a lot more than just the film industry, is I like to say measure measure twice, cut mm -hmm. once, right? Measure, mm -hmm. go ahead, measure twice and cut once. From my standpoint, in the film, in this, in that, in this space, I've seen a lot of people who they'll measure and then they get on set and they're just like scrambling. That's where the name chaos came from, is fixing the chaos right right it's because you you measure twice cut once but my uh, but the flip side of that is you expect it to you make a plan you make the plan then you throw it away because you know it's going to change right and then it's being adaptable putting out those fires knowing right. that somebody's car is going to break down on the way to the next set and they're going to be two hours behind and you're how do you swing this so i think as you gain years in the industry i won't say gray hair because mine's gone or blue hair um you what happens is you start uh you because you've built this plan to execute so well that you can relax and be like okay now how do i move it would you say that's one of the bigger skills because i saw you on set and you would always be calm 90 percent of the time no you would always <laughs> the only time you see me scrambling is early in the morning getting things going for me knocking off the first shot yeah. is is super important getting it rolling because because you got to get it going and sometimes i just want you know let's just get the first shot and get it done and then the rest of the day kind of falls in line but um but yeah no it's it's everybody has to know their role um you know uh, one of the recommendations i can make if someone's doing a production something that a lot of people don't do is at the beginning of the day you know you gather all the cast and crew around and you explain what you're doing. Like TV commercials are a great example of that. Usually TV commercials, you know, you hire everybody to come to a, on a specific day to do something. Everybody's kind of worked on their own. The, the wardrobe department's been working on their own. The actors, you know, been working on the scripts on their own. And everybody comes that day. Um, but a lot of the crew members, you know, who are essential, the grips and the gaffers and the makeup and vanity, everybody, they just show up because they say, okay, we're doing a commercial for this bank or whatever. One of the things I've always tried to do is at the beginning of every day, explain to everybody what we're doing, what we're doing it for, who the client is, what the day is going to look like. Because a lot of people just uh, get there and everybody just says, go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the camera guy has his assistants and he's like, well, set me up with this, you know, lens and this package. But they don't know what they're doing. And Sometimes, you know, one of the important things you really need to do is you need to value every member of the set. Um, and so I say, I treat PAs the same way I treat my clients. You know, they're an essential part of that set. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has a role to play and you have to respect that. And also one of my uh, early mentors was a lady named Mercy Palomo who, uh, and her brother, Louis Palomo. Um, but one thing I appreciated was even when I was at the lowest echelon of production as a production assistant, she'd always tell me what we're doing. Oh, we're doing this production today for this, this, and this, and this is what's gonna happen. 
she made me, but what that did was I, you know, wanted to be part of that process. So I would anticipate and want to be part of those things. There's a lot of producers that, you know, treat, you know, the lower echelons, if you want to call it, of the crew, right. PAs or assistants, you know, they don't tell them any information and they just say, well, just wait till we need you, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and what you have to do is you have to, you know, have everybody be a part of that process. And, you know, that really makes things even that much better because sometimes a PA may even have an idea and you say, yeah. And, and as a matter of fact, the very first commercial production I ever worked on was with a director who lives here in Miami named Camila Villa. Um, and we were doing a gene commercial for Venezuela on the beaches of Miami. And I remember there was, we were doing a scene. I always remember this, that we were doing a scene where some kids, little kids were just had to run around a tree, you know, and it was just the scene that they were doing. And I didn't know as a PA that, you know, you're not supposed to talk to the director. And I went up to the director and I said, Camilo, and, and who's a good friend now. And I said to him, I said, you know, what if the kids went the other way around the tree? Because then they're coming towards camera. And he was kind of like, yeah, that works. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> and he took advice from a PA, and who, you know, and, and maybe I should have kept my mouth shut. But, you know, I've, I've never wanted to uh, keep my mouth shut, which uh, my wife Joanna will tell everybody. Um, but, uh, you know, every, everybody, you know, has value on a film set. And if you understand that and, and treat them that way, then you have a better... Um, you know, uh, set day. And the other, the other thing is the fact that it also starts at the top down, the mood of a set. Oh, and so 100%. if you have a jerk of a director or top person, exec producer, or some who starts yelling and screaming at everybody, it trickles down and everybody feels the same way. And I've had my share of directors that I've worked with that, you know, essentially I've always felt like I was the filter, you know, they might be barking and mad or who knows whatever emotional crisis they're going through. But I would be that person that would take all the, you know, uh, vitriol. Right. And then try and, you know, calm it down and, you know, make everything, you know, for a smoother day um, so that everybody, you know, uh, because once you have that chaos happen at the top, it trickles down everybody and, and it becomes a nightmare. So that typically most music videos are like, that, <laughs> which is something I honestly, I've stayed away from music videos because music videos are typically chaos they're 100 you know chaos. so yeah. um and there's usually no plan they just all go to a location and start filming and Dance everybody around. starts dancing and <laughs> you know and and the poor steady cam operator who you know it's tiring to have a big giant camera right. you know on steady cam and back in the day when we had big giant film oh cameras you know they were you know walking tripods and that's one of the gripes of most steady cam operators is they're like you know i'm not a walking tripod you know Tell me the scene you want to do and we'll do it. But right. most music videos just shoot everything. Yeah. So um, figure it out in the post. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> exactly. But kind of coming back. So talking about chaos. Yeah. Pause that for one sec. So talking about chaos on when it first started, um, actually, when it first started, you started doing the music video side of it because it's funny. You just said music videos and coming back to it, music video. And if Paloma hits play, I this was a scene I don't know was supposed to happen or not because talk about getting all the way through to post and then getting there. Tell me about how, what happened in this. Well, actually, <laughs> the honest truth of this was um, we were doing a, a, a music video um, with the DJ Khaled, uh, you know, All I Do Is Win. And we filmed it in an arcade, which we had it up there, but we filmed it in an arcade um, at a, this pinball arcade up in uh, Delray Beach. And we did a whole shoot and we did the whole thing. And uh, Luke was the, the main character in that singing. Um, and then PBS came to us and said, you know, we can't do this song after we shot everything. We can't do the song, not because the lyrics of the version that we had weren't working. It's because there was another version out there that had, you know, explicit lyrics. And they felt like, oh, well, people might search up the other, you know, version of all i do is win which all i do is win is just a, a hugely popular song everywhere they everywhere. play it in arenas and sports yeah. and i mean it's not like you know people don't hear that song and so they said well you know you need to do something else and when we already shot it's done it's edited it's gone it's done right and and but we wanted to you know you there was such production value 
I'm sure um, we have some that, that we can actually uh, Vic, w- Vic was there as well, and uh, you know, all I do is win. I think we actually have some of the that footage. was the that was uh, Vic was uh, when the Mavic Two came out. Oh you my brought, gosh! You brought a Mavic Two, and you were flying a drone inside the pinball arcade, which was great. Um, and we didn't. I didn't hit anybody. No, you didn't hit anybody or crash anybody. So <laughs> crash. so, but uh, reminds me of another thing. I'll tell you in a second. But um, so, but we wanted to use that footage, so we decided to to create a, a our you know a proprietary song our own song mm-hmm. uh called uh the what was it, state uh, of the art uh, are the, art. Luke, Luke should remember this there you go there's the music the whole and it was this was a super you know this is this was this music video when you were filming was more advanced than most mu- real music or when I say real oh, you know what I'm saying this was a super entailed with the graphics and right. everything you you guys went really so what we had to do was we wanted to, we didn't want to just, you know, put this on the cutting room floor. We wanted to use it because it was great. So, so what we decided to do was change the song entirely, but still use most of the footage. And what that was going to mean was we had to reshoot Luke singing this new song. So as you saw earlier, we shot Luke in green screen. And what we decided to do instead was to make the kids uh, kind of go inside the pinball machines. And but we needed Luke to, you know, his his face singing this new song. So we shot his, you know, face in close up against green screen. And then, you know, we composited into this new version. So this was originally all I do is win, which didn't uh, end up making the broadcast. But then, see, we have Luke, who became part of the art, who was part of the machines. And we had the kids bouncing around inside the pinball machines. But we could still use the dancing footage. Uh, right. of the kids dancing uh, in the arcade. Um, so it actually, I actually, I think it ended up being even better than All I Do Is Win because we were able to have a lot of those, you know, compos- composited elements um, and make it make it a lot more fun. That's what uh, I was going to, yeah, and being able to, like, go all the way through, film it, have everything done, and then turn around and get to the network and be like, oh, wait, we have to change that. So that's, that's why I say sometimes, you know, the adaptability and the, the chaos... <laughs> You gotta you gotta lean into it. And but so, speaking of chaos, yeah. one, of, one of the other things I was shooting with Luke Uh-oh. was on the uh, New River in Fort Lauderdale. We were doing a <laughs> thing about Italy, and we were gonna put him in a you know in a gondola. And um, you know, at the time, I had an older drone, the 3DR Solo, which was a cheapy drone. The thing is, is the GPS on those drones were it's awful. Awful. And at one point, the drone just I don't know if Luke remembers this, but the drone started like just going drifting and all of a sudden it was drifting and then it came back and was flying and it almost killed your wife, which she'll remember. (laughs) She had to duck out of the way and the drone like went straight and she ducked out of the way and the drone hit, went straight into a tree and dropped down. And I was scared for my life because I was almost going to take a life. Um, So, you you know, some of these drones you have to be careful with because, and the reason that was, was because of the buildings all the tall buildings in downtown Fort Lauderdale, you know, messed with the communications. So the GPS was just still happens, just crazy. I was shooting a, a video for a friend a few years ago, and we're downtown Miami, and the mirrors on the building caused it. It crashed. I, you know, I've been flying for a while, and many, and crashed at forty feet up. Thank God it. You're not a never. drone pilot unless you've crashed. Oh, I've crashed many. So if, I guess if you're a drone pilot and you said you've never crashed, you're I, not, I would you're not, not trust quality. you. Exactly. I would not trust you with a drone. Agree, a hundred percent. You have to. You, you have to crash. You have to understand what that is. Nope. Well, my gosh, we've gone on for a minute. I, I still want to. So can people see over to how do they see some of the projects? Obviously, we can link some of the, the kids. Yeah, to- well, Crossing Over Towns on PBS. So, you know, it depends when it comes on PBS. If you go to the website, um, we have crossingovertown.com and uh, on Facebook as well. And whenever there's a presentation of it, um, Actually, I think we're going to be presenting it at, at Barry University uh, in the, hold on, February 26th. Okay. It'll be at Barry University. Um, actually, it's, it, besides the PBS broadcast, we've, we've had an incredible tour with it. We actually went to different um, universities. Uh, Cornell University up in Ithaca actually brought mm-hmm. us up there to show the film to students up there. That's awesome. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely made the rounds. Um, Kids Stew, if you go on YouTube to Kids Stew uh, TV, um, you can see most of the segments. Um, South Florida PBS has the full shows online through PBS. Um, 
and and, and actually a lot of these shows even crossing over town um uh, if you go, if you subscribe with a, what's called the PBS Viewer, PBS has its own app. So okay. a lot of these things are online. Even uh, State of Rodeo is on there because most of the stuff I've done in in this realm is on PBS, and um, you can you can find them through the PBS Viewer, and and otherwise you know they'll be broadcast at some point or another. Yeah, so. well, I'm, we will we will keep in keep in uh, the links current and. Uh, be able to go below and we'll start forwarding some of it but I just I just think it's fascinating because you've you've accomplished what a lot of people can't they start in Florida they learn and then they leave Florida yeah and um, I'm really hoping to see that trend turn I've heard about it forever that we're building the next studio here in Miami and the next thing and as you even said you know it's crazy I did not know that that Jacksonville was supposed to be, did you say Jackson, Jacksonville? Jacksonville, Florida, yeah. Was supposed to be Hollywood. Yes, And absolutely. it just goes to show that maybe, you know, 100 Things years change. later, it still it's, hasn't changed. Yeah. Well, we'll set, I don't know, that's, I don't yeah. want to. Now it's all about know. incentive programs. That's why Georgia is so popular now, because they have a, a great incentive program. Um, but now what you're seeing is uh, Miami is starting to offer local incentives, like uh, for outsiders to come in and produce, also Broward County is doing a great job. In fact, there's a big studio where um, where the, the place where they filmed Cape Fear many years ago, um, that that land is now gonna, uh, there's a big studio that's supposed to go in there. Um, and you know, maybe it's, you know, like Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. Um, but definitely the incentives and, and we need uh, more people to support, you know, the film production, especially like with the Florida legislature and mm -hmm. pushing for you know, having incentives because it does bring it's a boon to the economy. It's uh, incredible, and what and it's proven that what people see on TV, they will come and travel to and see. I mean, Miami Vice. I was thank you. Miami Vice brought people to Miami. No, no all of those clubs and restaurants, everything you see on Miami Vice didn't exist mm -hmm. at that time. And actually, what we know as South Beach today grew out of Miami Vice. Exactly, uh, because people would see that imagery. For sure. And so that's why it, I, it boggles my mind sometimes when you you think that it's the best marketing, if you will. I mean, that's that is marketing. So why are we not doing it? I don't know. That's beyond me. I know I'm just trying to, you know, make Actually, my own projects. One of my clients um, was Visit Florida. I've done a lot of videos for Visit Florida over the years. And years ago, there was a controversy. Um, they did a promotion with Pitbull where Pitbull did a big Visit Florida Camp, uh, music video commercial campaign and actually I didn't do the video uh, with Pitbull but a lot of the time-lapse footage uh, that was featured in that particular one was all my time-lapse that I'd done for Visit Florida and the marketers at Visit Florida at the time um, they found that the Pitbull inspired commercial um, actually brought like tenfold the amount of income into Florida just because of that one commercial with Pitbull um, and there was a controversy about it because at the time, uh, a, some people were upset that Pitbull was getting paid a lot of money, uh, from the state of Florida to be in that commercial. But, you know, I mean, I think he was paid a million dollars, but it brought over $10 million in revenue back because of that. So absolutely. That's amazing. It, it does work, you right. know, that, you know, people, people imagery, you know, matters and, and people, get influenced by that so it's definitely a boon to the economy when they see these places mm -hmm. um on film for sure well you guys heard it that's it I, i'm gonna close on that because there's nothing better than that which is you who have this experience you've made it in miami you've done all these projects and there's no better advice than just get out there and do it and thank you and thank you. uh yeah and thank you for sharing with everybody and with that said, and, and i'm excited to be here in the chaos made studios I can't believe we're up on the 110th floor with a beautiful view of Miami out there, which is incredible. It is incredible. So, um, well, the rent, I mean, you can see the skyline and I, yeah. So it's, keep watching the Chaos Made podcast. Smash that button. <laughs> you heard it right there, folks. That was it. And by the way, these are fabulous. The coffee was amazing. The cigars, I think, you know, Absolutely. I, next time you, I'll, I'll try and provide. I'll we'll see. do a whole new segment on just cigars. Cigars. Cigar talk. Cigar talk. I'll get Absolutely. you on with Ron. Ron May and you. Oh, Absolutely. It. Love it. Oh, love it. I think Ron Let's May and Scott with Cigar Talk. Yeah. We'll do a little subsection here of the whole Miami and, oh, that'd be a good one. Well. All right, sir. I say, I say thank you very much. I'll take off my ears and uh, shake your hand and say.
Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shout out to and, and shout out to Frank and everybody there and Luke and everybody for staying behind the cameras and making this happen. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>